Okay, so today uh, the topic is wavelets and inversion. And based on the principle dessert first, let me just show first what does the wavelet sparsity reconstruction do uh, in a tomography situation. So let me just run this one and, and comment on what's happening. So uh, the data set I'm using here is taken from the Finnish Inverse Problems Society website where we have this open data set. So not the Lotus today, but we are using actually this Walnut data set. So if anyone wants to try these with the real data, you can just download the matrices and data from here. And what happened here, so I used an iterative method, so iterations uh, try to make the reconstruction better at every step. Here you see the reconstruction, so this is the reconstruction of, of the walnut, of the slice of a walnut, and on the side you see something else, four pictures like this. There I'm showing actually the wavelet coefficients we are using in this computation. Uh, the way to think about why there are four is that there is actually, these here are vertical detail coefficients at the finest scale. These are horizontal detail coefficients at the finest scale. And these are diagonal coefficients at the finest scale. Well, there is only uh, one scale in this computation actually, so the finest scale is the only scale uh, and the remaining guy here is the so-called low-pass part. Now we could do this with higher resolution as well. What I'm doing now, uh, in the open data set we have three resolutions. We have 82 by 82, which we just saw. Then there is uh, 2 times 82, so we can put here 2, so then we have 164 by 164, and also, like written here, then the third option for the resolution includes here number 4, and that's already such a computation, I will not try to do it in my head anyway. Oh well, maybe it's 328, but yeah, something like that. But let's try now for... Uh, one step bigger resolution and see what happens. So here the iteration is going. Now you see we have actually one more scale. There are more little pictures on the right in the wavelet decomposition. Some uh, weird curves are computed. I will comment on them uh, in a minute. And right now the iteration, I'm just saying that take 500 steps. This is of course not good in general. There should be a stopping rule. The iteration should go on uh, as far as, as somehow the result is good enough according to some good quantitative principle. Here that's not the case. I'm just running 500 iterations and that's it. So now uh, this picture looks a bit different. Uh, again, we have this a little bit blocky uh, reconstruction containing lots of little squares or different size squares, bigger squares and smaller squares. And now on this side, again, we have the wavelet decomposition. So again, here are, I think these are the vertical details at the finest level because I see a little bit vertical stuff here and here and this looks more like the horizontal details. And this is the so-called diagonal details. And then what we previously we saw here only one picture, that was the low pass part. In this case, we have further divided the low pass part similarly in, in, in the same way. So now what it means is that here are the coefficients, uh, vertical, diagonal, horizontal, for the next bigger details, two times bigger details than, than here. So these are the smallest details we consider. Here, these relate to two times bigger details. Yep. Sorry, can you repeat? 
Yes. Yeah, the basic idea here is that we are using uh, some uh, a multi-resolution transform, meaning that, and also this this is the hard wavelet transform we are looking at, and the basic idea there is that we we divide our image into totally independent orthonormal uh, building blocks. So we have a set of building blocks that are orthonormal to each other. Uh, so because of the orthonormality of the building blocks, we are actually dividing our image into totally independent parts. And the multi-resolution word refers to uh, the fact that we are using building blocks of the smallest size. In this case, they are have size 2 by 2 pixels only. And mm, these coefficients in this small square here, they, uh, so this is the absolute value of the coefficient, and I think I have in my logarithm so we can better see, see them because they are quite small. But anyway, if, if we think what is, for example, this number right here, what does it correspond to? So, because this is about the vertical details uh, and the location of this pixel refers, you see, this is half smaller, this square here is only half size of this, ah, sorry, of this big square of the original image. So this is like a map of where are the two by two details we are looking at. So this location here is, I think, somewhere here in the big image. It's like, it's like a map in a little bit smaller scale. So the number here is telling what is the coefficient of a two by two element located here. And the 2 by 2 element, because this is the vertical details, it's a 2 by 2 building block. So it's 2 by 2 pixels. Let's say the left column has two zeros and the right column has two ones. In the similar way, here, uh, in, in kind of the same location, we have uh, the coefficient for a building block, which is also a 2 by 2 uh, building block here, but that has one row of zeros and one uh, the other row has ones so it's kind of a horizontal looking uh, building block and here corresponding to the same location we have a building block that looks like a checkerboard so it has like one zero zero one in, in a two by two arrangement so those are the building blocks and then when we move here if you look at here again at the same location, you see this is like a map, again now smaller map, but this number here is corresponding to the same location here, but to a 4x4 four four element. So actually this number here is corresponding to a 4x4 four four building block here that has, uh, so it should be vertical I think, so there will be two columns of zeros and then columns three and four have ones. So it's twice bigger, but kind of a vertical looking building block. Uh, is this explanation clear at all? I mean, who thinks this is clear? One or two thinks this is clear. Okay, yes, let's, yep. Yeah, you reintroduced this uh, on the, uh, I think I saw some courses, yeah. Matrix yeah. Yeah. yeah, but maybe uh, slightly minor. How, how did we count those coefficients? Like, yes. The wavelets, and I remember the principle. Uh, maybe if there's someone else who. You don't have to explain to me. It's not to no, no, this today is about explaining the whole stuff. Okay. So maybe I, maybe I ended up explaining. Well, mm, Let's uh, let's uh, look at the reconstruction thing a bit more, and then come back to this this explanation of what the wavelets are. I hope, uh, yeah, I hope this will be clarified at some point. Anyway, I think uh, let's let's 
maybe take a look at this. Uh, so what's happening, for example, in this graph? So as you see, I write here, it's a ratio of non-zero coefficients. So actually, this, uh, this reconstruction method we are using here is a sparsity promoting reconstruction. So it aims for a reconstruction that has uh, a significant amount of wavelet coefficients zero, and only, only some of them non-zero. Um, and that's why I'm monitoring here in the iterate how many of the wavelet coefficients are non-zero. And here we see that when the iteration goes on, we have so here we have 100% and here we have 60%. So when the iteration goes on, uh, the reconstruction has less and less non-zero coefficients. And it seems from this curve that the process would still continue. So maybe we can run this uh, for a bit more iterations than 500 to see uh, what happens. So I'll just change here. Let's put 1,000 and see uh, if, it, if it settles down or seems to converge a little bit better, this. So now if you look now we are we are approaching 70 percent and I think it's it's putting more and more coefficients to zero when the iteration is going on and let's see I think it will it will uh, probably settle down to some kind of limit value in this computation. At least it, it seems to somehow converge along the iteration and, and go towards some kind of final sparsity value. And one idea in this uh, choosing the regularization parameter is that if we somehow a priori know how many non-zeros uh, our unknown has. For example, in one study we thought with the walnuts, we actually, uh, my former student Esa Niemi uh, actually manually uh, cut a few walnuts by sawing them. And we took a photograph of, of the slice and analyzed the wavelet uh, sparsity of the photographs and thought that this is now our a priori information, how much is the sparsity. So now it's, well, it's not completely converged yet, but anyway, it seems to be hitting something like, uh, like, like half. And now in, in this iteration, we actually have here a parameter called mu. And if I make mu bigger, I make mu bigger, then we will have uh, less non-zero wavelets. So let's let's see this computation and then uh, I'll try to explain more carefully what's going on here. So now you see the ratio of non-zero, it's already like in the 30 percent. I made it a little bit bigger, not, not even so much bigger, like five times bigger or something, this mu. And our iteration is really now putting almost all the wavelet coefficients to zero. Yes? Mm -hmm. There is, exactly, it is, it is a threshold parameter telling uh, what size of coefficients should be put to zero. And so you even see how the, the reconstruction looks like. It looks rather different than before. It's even more blocky. And it has these, lots of these bigger squares going on and very few of these small. You see there are some, some of the small squares going on here. 
So these are the two by two building blocks appearing, but mostly it's about these uh, bigger building blocks that, that appear. And we can see it on the wavelet uh, coefficient side. The fine details are mostly zero. These, these parts are mostly black. And we have here a bit more of them, but somehow the low pass part is the most uh, populated by non-zero coefficients. And we see it's like something like 20% remained in this computation. And we, and we get this very blocky reconstruction with the hard wavelets. Okay, let me now try to explain a little bit what was going on in this computation. I call this the dessert first, but uh, I'm not completely sure if this was... <laughs> anyway, let's see, let's see what happens. Uh, what this is based on is actually a legendary paper by uh, Ingrid Dobeshi, Christine de Mol, and Michel de Vries from 2004, published in Communications in Pure and Applied Mathematics, which is Oh, like a number one paper in applied math, at least in the top three. It's a, it's a really strong journal. And here uh, they used convex analysis to find uh, a soft thresholding method for computing the reconstruction. So this is one of the key ingredients used in the iteration I just showed you. This S mu is the so-called uh, soft thresholding operator. It looks like this. It takes in uh, a real number x, takes in a real number x, and if x is smaller than half mu in absolute value, it will be replaced by zero. That's the thresholding part. Then uh, the soft here means that if we would do hard thresholding, we would have just x here and here. But the soft thresholding uh, is a continuous operation. So that's why we have this plus and minus mu over 2. Let me illustrate this uh, to hopefully at least make some, at least one thing during this lecture understandable, I hope. Let's uh, make a Um, so thresholding so so let's choose mu Let's say it's 0 0.0, let's put 0 0.1, and evaluation points, let's put x equals, uh, let's go from minus 1 to 1, and I don't know, let's have 512 points, for example. And then let's make a plot. Uh, we need a figure and uh, let's just plot here. Mm. Let's do hard and soft thresholding functions. Uh, thresholding hard uh, looks like this. First of all, it's just x, but then uh, we put to zero anything that's smaller in absolute value than mu over 2. So these will be zero. So let's put here x and the hard thresholding Let's plot that with blue, for example, like this. Uh, 
And let's see how this looks like. Maybe let's make Mu a little bit bigger. So here you see it's thresholded and there's a discontinuity at the, at the thresholding step. Then uh, let's do the soft thresholding we saw actually in the paper. So this one, the same thing, this we already did, this one, but then we need to do these two other things. And so threshold soft, let's start with x, and this is the same, but then when x is smaller, this should be the same thing, but uh, plus mu over 2 and maybe let's have these for mathematical completeness and then minus and let's plot this Oh, yes. Thank you. Indeed. I think it will be better this way. Okay, and then we run it. And we should have here the soft one. Okay, and here you see the blue one has the jump. It's the hard thresholding. And the red one is the soft thresholding that's just made continuous. And where this function comes from, it's, it comes from convex analysis and some duality theorems and stuff that we don't go into too much in this course. But that's where it comes from, and uh, luckily it's very simple. We can just use it. And how to use this? So the basic idea is to... Um, well, not this one. Let, let's go further in the paper to see how they suggest the... the uh, minimization. So this is the thing we are doing. So we have uh, this usual data fidelity term. So K will be our tomography matrix. F is as usual, it's our, our pixel image. G is our uh, measurement that we have been calling M or M tilde in this course. So this is the data fidelity term. And then this is the regularization part here. And you see, this is written in a general form uh, so that here can be coefficients of f in, in some orthonormal basis. And we are just now using the Haar wavelets, but we could use some other orthonormal basis function set here as well. So this is a gener general method. And you see, here we have the absolute values. So this is the L1 norm in some sense. Uh, we don't have any power 2 here. We have absolute value and, and power 1 here. So this is promoting sparsity, like we discussed previously in the course, like in the compressed sensing and sparsity promoting sense. So when this kind of functional is minimized, when we have here this uh, quadratic uh, data fidelity term and then something L1 based term, uh, the result will have only a finite number of non-zero coefficients here. Uh, well, in the case of an infinite set of basis functions. Then in, in finite cases like we do, the sparsity just means that, well, there is a, only a fraction of the coefficients are, are non-zero, and most of them zero. And it depends on this mu. Here the mu is shown in the, in the form of a regularization parameter, 
like we looked in Tihonov and these regularization, variation on regularization methods we studied. But in the iteration, mu appears here. So it's quite a simple iteration you see here. We iterate with f. Those are the f's uh, I showed you. So what happens with f in each iteration is that uh, this is the previous iterate. So first we take x-ray images by the matrix and we subtract from the actual data. So this part here is the data discrepancy for, for uh, fn minus 1. Then this is the uh, adjoint operator of k. In our case, it's the transpose of the matrix K, which is uh, physically, in tomography, it's the back projection operator. It sends the data, back projects it to the space. Uh, let me ask, to whom is it clear what the back projection is doing in tomography? Two or half here. Let me demonstrate that in a minute as well. So one question to be addressed very soon is what is this K star? Well, yeah, it is the transpose of our tomography matrix, but it has an important physical meaning that I will explain in a minute. So then also the, there's the F n minus 1. Here is uh, this kind of uh, thing. And then S mu operator is applied here. This is the soft thresholding operator in... Uh, the orthonormal basis. So you see what S mu is doing for a function g. Uh, first, it takes the coefficients of g in our orthonormal basis. Then it will soft threshold those coefficients and build back uh, a function. So in this formula, if you leave out the, the S mu and this s mu, it would just be the usual orthonormal basis expansion of the function g. So we'd have, so without s mu here in this formula, we would have g equals the sum over basis elements, uh, inner product between g and the basis function, times the basis function. So this is the way like Fourier series work, or all wavelets, or many other orthonormal bases. So what we do instead of uh, reconstructing g perfectly from its coefficients using the orthonormal basis, we go ahead and softly threshold the coefficients. And this means that every coefficient here that's smaller than half mu in absolute value will be put to zero, exactly to zero. So this will promote sparsity in every iteration, but uh, it doesn't promote a percentage of coefficients. This is thresholding based on the size of the coefficient. So it's not completely straightforward what is the relationship between mu and the sparsity level we saw in the iteration. But anyway, this is the iteration that's going on. And in this paper they, they showed that uh, with this simple soft thresholding iteration, uh, you can compute the minimizer of this sparsity promoting functional there. And that's what we were just computing. And choosing mu uh, bigger will give more sparse, so less non-zero coefficients and a smaller mu will give more non-zero coefficients. Okay, so now I think I think the next two things to explain are what is the back projection operator and then to explain a bit better what are these wavelets. Uh, how do you think? Uh, is, this, is this quite an okay interpretation? Yeah. Uh, just a question. Uh, here we are just, this FN is the mu wave of the okay. Yes, F, yeah. Fn will, when, when n grows, Fn will converge to the minimizer of this functional. Mm -hmm. How do you set the F0? F0 can be anything. Okay. It can be the zero image or, or, yeah. You can think that F0 is just a zero image. It, this will converge regardless of the starting value. Oh, well, that being said, uh, it will converge faster with a good initial guess, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, 
I think it's quite okay to just have zeros. And that's what I did uh, in the computation I showed you. So let's see what's going on in this computation. So, uh, so th this is just about loading the tomography matrix and the measurement. The next step is I will just divide uh, both the matrix and the measurement by the matrix norm of A. I mean, our measurement equation doesn't change if I, if I divide either side with the same number. But then uh, it's just, then our measurement matrix will have norm 1 and, and uh, it just simplifies a little bit. Well, somehow the formula, the iteration assumes that the, the norm of the matrix K is at most 1. So then, uh, well, here I just I just compute how many uh, wavelet uh, resolution steps can I take. Uh, this is the number of iterations. This is our mu. These are the wavelet filters used in the hard wavelet, which uh, you will study in the exercise. And I hope you read a little memo I wrote to you in the, in the past lecture. And then, so here we initialize, so Nargisa you see here, we have uh, initialized just by the zero image. We initialize also the, the plots I'm showing to you during the iteration. And then the thing starts. So, so if n minus uh, 1, I just set uh, to previous reconstruction, so the, in, in the beginning, it's just the zero image, and in the next round, it will be the result of the previous round. So this is Fn minus 1. And then let's start computing Fn. Uh, so first of all, I compute, if we look at this one, so we need, we need k applied to Fn minus 1. So that's this one. Then uh, we subtract, from the data, we subtract uh, the, the previous guy. And then I'm just recording here the, the data fit, how good is the data fit uh, to show during the iteration. So this is just kind of monitoring the results. Then we do the so-called back projection, which I will explain in the minute. So this is the K star. In MATLAB notation, it's the transpose of our matrix A. And, and then we reshape our result in the form of an image. It was a vector here, but then we make it an image, and then we apply our wavelet thresholding operator, which is written in a different uh, M file. We apply it to this one, which is the uh, Fn minus 1 plus uh, all the stuff here. So again, this is this is this whole thing. So so this, yeah, so F minus 1 and then all of this thing here, we sum them and we apply the soft thresholding. So here, we sum them and we apply this function and we give it our two uh, wavelet filters then we give it uh, the picture we want to soft threshold and then uh, I think this is the depth of the wavelet transform we want to do and this is the thresholding parameter. Okay and then here because we do tomography we can do this uh, replacing any negative pixels that may result from the previous step we will just replace them by zeros, and that's it. That's the iteration. Rather simple. Uh, and let's see what is this wavelet operator. So this is the soft thresholding uh, operation. So you see it's rather short. So what we do... Uh, we do the wavelet transform. Uh, we apply soft thresholding SMU, which is another M file. 
and we inverse wavelet transform. Yes, this wave trans 2D and wave trans 2D in the uh, I wrote them. Yeah, I will give them to you uh, yeah. in the in the website, and we'll take a look also how they work. So like that, and then uh, there's just this SMU thingy, which we actually already saw when we plotted the thing. So that's how the iteration works. Yep. Yes. Yes, 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 so um, two points, well, first of all, uh, this is really a different method, like like uh, we did the Tihonov uh, with the smoothness penalty, then we know it favors continuous functions or smooth functions, and with the total variation we know it favors piecewise constant uh, images, where the boundaries between piecewise constant regions are as short as possible. That's the TV idea. So with the wavelets, uh, it's, it's again a different type of a priori information. So we, we think of knowing and hopefully in some situation we know that our unknown, when expanded in the wavelet basis, has some kind of property, well in this case the sparsity property, that maybe we know about it that in our, in our unknowns, uh, typically there should be only 60% of non-zero wavelet coefficients. So that's something we can enforce with this algorithm. That's the way I think about it anyway. It's, uh, it's good to have a big selection of different a priori informations and algorithms to promote them. And what does it mean, the wavelet sparsity? It's, uh, hard to say. I mean, there are function spaces, so-called Biasov spaces, um, that the, whose, whose norms can be expressed by weighted uh, wavelet coefficient, weighted sums of, of absolute values of, of some powers of wavelet coefficients. Anyway, so there are function spaces like that, but um, it's not very intuitive how those function spaces are. So I would say this is one more approach in, in the selection of different methods to apply. So it's basically you have a second power on the absolute value or if you want to Yes, yeah. And then it wouldn't be a sparsity anymore, but it would be a different function space, yeah. a different thing to do. Yes? So this converging on any choice of mu? Yes, this, this converges with any choice of mu, yes. Yes. And then it's a different thing how useful the reconstruction is. Because if mu is very large, uh, then our reconstruction will be the zero image, which whose usefulness is... So it's, it's not always converging to solve the same As far as I understand, this in this paper they prove that, that it will always converge to the minimizer of this this uh, functional here. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe yeah, actually, I must say, I'm. I, I'm not. I'm not sure if if this, uh, especially with the, because there's this infinite number of. Uh, well, to put it shortly, I am not sure if theoretically this would converge to zero. But in the limit when mu goes to infinity, I think it will converge to zero. But for any finite mu, I'm not sure if it can converge to zero or not. But in in 
computational practical situation, uh, when mu is large, it will give you just a black image, which is mostly zero. Yeah, it, it could be. Yeah, good, good points. Really, the, uh, yeah, there should be some further study. <laughs> what's going on? Yes. Hey, I think uh, let's have the break now, and and I try to, I try to continue from this in a meaningful way in fifteen minutes. Thank you.